Mr. Mitchell history. I know what you're going for because you're just doing it with your students, but I think that that is actually a really important channel and you should give it a name that is memorable for what it is, you know, like... Preventing World War Three. China before World War Three or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Preventing World War Three. Look, there's other things that you can aim for, it, but that's that's a cool channel, man. That's a cool channel. It's a really good idea. Okay, so before we address the title of this video, I'm just going to let you know what this series is about. Throughout 2021, we did two series on China. The first was just a straight history of China, set at a pretty basic level, and then the second was the history of the Sino-US relationship to give you context for World War 3. Unfortunately, those videos were in the era of the $20 mic and a PC that had the processing power of a Kodak, so the production quality was especially homebrand. According to Dung, China needed to modernize its agriculture, its industry, its military, but the tech is better, my knowledge in the area is better, and with the release of Kenobi, there's even more material for Star Wars cutaways. But this new series is far more than just a remastering. This is the complete chronological series to bring you up to speed on all things China, including their relationship with America. This is the story of how China left decades of internal war to plunge into further unimaginable chaos, but to then rise from the ashes. So the date is October the 1st, 1949, and Mao heads out to a packed crowd in Tiananmen Square to announce the beginning of the People's Republic of China. According to Mao, the civil war is over and Chiang Kai-shek has lost. Chiang would say otherwise, but he had been so badly defeated that from Taiwan, he was in no position to threaten Mao. But Mao couldn't take any risks. If you don't know much about Chinese history, essentially they'd been in on and off again war for the first half of the 20th century. First it was the 1911 revolution to end the Qing dynasty, then it was the era of the warlords when the revolutionary government became fractured, then it was fighting off the Japanese from 1931 to 1945, and then it was the Chinese civil war between Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek from 1945 to 1949. If Mao wasn't careful, his PRC would be just another chapter in a turbulent period of Chinese history. So what did Mao do to ensure that Chiang's KMT would be no risk to his regime? Well, surprisingly, his first move was to reward KMT defectors. For example, Fu Zhuoi had surrendered his garrison to the communists when they advanced on Beijing, and as a result, Mao gave him the Ministry of Hydraulics. You're fired. No, he's not. Well, you gonna overrule me on that too? You can go. <sighs> However, for most who had sided with the KMT, a much more sinister fate was to fall upon them all. Mao's campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries was a government-led drive to weed out any people who were still sympathetic towards the KMT. Have a look at this poster here promoting the campaign. This shady fedora-wearing guy, who reminds you of the best era of YouTube, was the classic stereotype for a conspiring counter-revolutionary plotting treason against Mao's PRC. Okay, my MLG video editing is a little rusty. Like the video if you want MLG to make a comeback and let me know below what your favorite MLG video was. Mine was MLG, it's academic. But another really popular depiction was the overweight cigar smoking capitalist. Now, Mao's Minister for Public Security said this about the campaign. We must not miss this opportunity. Probably this is our only operation for suppressing counter-revolutionaries. The purpose is not just to kill several counter-revolutionaries, more importantly, this campaign is for mass mobilization. And make no mistake, Mao was completely on board with this. Though Mao made it clear he didn't want the wrong people being killed, he put quotas on executions in accordance with population size. He argued that hardline counter-revolutionaries counted for less than 1% of the population in all regions, and that roughly 0.1% of the population would have to be executed in order to get rid of the worst counter-revolutionary elements. However, in reality, many provinces did not have enough bandits to meet this quota, and so many were recklessly arrested and not even tried before being determined as guilty of trumped up charges that included collaborating with imperialism, bribing government officials, participating in armed rebellion, participating in spying or espionage, and looting and sabotage. Based on the seriousness of the crime, people received either life imprisonment or the death penalty. In terms of exercising control, this was incredibly successful and Mao could actually go on to consolidate power 
as at least 2.6 million people were arrested, 1.3 million were imprisoned, and then 712,000 were executed. Now, before we moralize about how terrible this was, which it was, it is important to remember the context. China had been in internal war for nearly four decades and had only had brief stints of a functioning government. Despite clearly acknowledging what was happening as dangerously terrible, many Chinese were broadly okay with what was happening because it prevented anarchy. Unfortunately for them, the success of this would pave the way for Mao to begin his cultural revolution a decade later. But in terms of bringing about the revolution, more had to happen than just the elimination of the old guard. Obviously, Mao needed to put forward new policies. However, the leadership of the party actually opted for slow and progressive implementation of communism rather than radical and immediate. Unlike the industrialized Soviets, the Chinese revolution began from an agricultural context and there was little expertise in running factories. Only 5% of China's 600 million people had worked in industry. Not only that, but many key business leaders had fled to Hong Kong and Taiwan when the communist victory started to look inevitable. And with factory output 44% below that of 1937 when Japan went beyond Manchuria to invade all of China, Mao's number two, Lu Xiaoqi, felt as though the time wasn't right to eliminate the ruling class. So private enterprise was still allowed and in cities like Xi'an, most businesses stayed in private hands. It is also worth noting that by the end of the civil war, hyperinflation had reached dangerously high levels and so the communists removed many yuan notes from circulation. And in terms of social policy, polygamy, sex trafficking and infanticide were now all declared illegal. And I'll bridge the domestic and foreign policy sections by talking about the two major annexations that the PRC completed upon the end of the civil war. Firstly, Mao's PLA entered Xinjiang in 1949 and completed the annexation in 1950. Xinjiang was an interesting part of China because part of it was controlled by the Soviet-backed East Turkestan Republic and then the rest by Chang's KMT. The main group of people that were from here were not actually Han Chinese but actually Turkic Muslims, also known as Uyghurs. And so in 1955, the PRC gave Xinjiang the title of being a semi-autonomous province. What this meant was that the Uyghurs had their own local government but this government answered to the Communist Party and yielded its resources over to the PRC. Secondly, Mao's China annexed Tibet, which had been independent since the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1912. The two fought from 1950 to 1951, but Tibet didn't have the strength to resist and signed a 17-point peace deal. China's military focus was to be on consolidating its borders rather than fighting in foreign wars, with one major exception. Okay, so when it comes to Mao's foreign policy, he had to immediately adapt to the emerging Cold War. During the Civil War, America gave Chiang Kai-shek tentative backing, but when Chiang repeatedly ignored instructions, America started to pull back their support. However, as tensions between America and the Soviets grew over their interests in Europe, by 1950, America was ready to resume its support for Chiang. Chiang Kai-shek's Taiwan was seen as the legitimate representative of China to the UN, and America said it would wait for the dust to settle before considering recognizing the PRC. Not only that, but the CIA got involved too. The CIA in 1947, and it really is at the root of some of the uh, corrupt, out-of-control elites in America. You see, the CIA backed air raids on the mainland from Taiwan and Burma. From the end of the Civil War to 1967, the CIA-supported Black Bats flew more than 800 missions over the PRC, including bombings of Shanghai and Nanjing. This obviously pushed Mao's China further towards Stalin, who had already supported them with armaments in the Civil War. And so in 1950, Stalin and Mao signed the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. Essentially, this was the deal. China would receive 300 million US dollars in loans, Soviet experts would oversee the factories that China lacked expertise in, and Stalin promised military support in the event of a war. In exchange, Western Xinjiang and Eastern Manchuria would be Soviet spheres of influence, and China had to sell surplus metal to the Soviets. And so finally, these Cold War tensions roped China into the Korean War. If you know nothing about this war, essentially Japan had governed Korea from 1910 until the end of World War II, and long story short, the Soviets and Americans had different ideas as to who should take over the leadership. The Americans wanted Syngman Rhee, while the Soviets wanted Kim Il-sung. A temporary division along the 38th degree of northern latitude was set up, with Kim in the north and Syngman Rhee in the south. Rhee called for elections to be held for the leadership, but Kim protested with much fewer people in the north, and it is generally accepted that these elections were manipulated. So in 1950, Kim invaded the South and then Truman brought in US troops to defend the South and with UN approval, crossed northwards of the 38th parallel. At this point, Mao decided intervention was essential to avoid an American-backed regime sharing a border with them. 
And so China immediately sent 300,000 troops to repel the American advance, and then a further 1.2 million would fight in this war. Mao opted for a war of attrition in some of the worst conditions, with soldiers literally freezing to death. Once the US-backed forces had been repelled back to the 38th parallel, the leader of the army, Peng Dehuai, wanted a settlement. After all, this would prevent an American-backed regime from sharing a border with them. However, Mao won a total victory and 400,000 would die in the course of the war. To give you a taste of who Mao was, three months after his son Mao Wanying died in the war, his advisors went to break the news to him, petrified of his reaction. Mao's response to them was this, In a revolutionary war, you always pay a price. Anying was one of thousands. You shouldn't take it as something special just because he was one of my sons. Ultimately, the war would result in a stalemate and Kim Il-sung's North Korea would be an important buffer state between China and American-backed South Korea. However, with China directly fighting against the US, America stepped up its Cold War support for Chang. Taiwan was now to be a vital part of America's containment strategy in East Asia, and America would veto any attempt to have Beijing rather than Taipei recognize as the true China before the United Nations. Mao was now firmly on the side of Stalin, but in 1953, his close ally died. And the new Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, would be much less friendly to Mao. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for next week as we look at how Mao was forced to react to Khrushchev's destalinization in Russia, and at best, see Mao make a plan that seriously backfires, or at worst, see Mao make a seriously sinister plan. Don't forget to let me know what your favorite MLG video is as well. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.